This is Philosophy Bites with me, Nigel Warburton. And me, David Edmonds. If you enjoy Philosophy Bites, please support us. We're currently unfunded and all donations would be gratefully received. For details, go to www.philosophybites.com. Panpsychism is the belief that all material things, however small, have an element of individual consciousness. On the face of it, it sounds like a bizarre doctrine. But Philip Goff believes that it's better than all the alternative theories about consciousness. He argues that consciousness cannot be understood in physical, scientific terms. And he traces the origins of this position to the Italian polymath Galileo. Philip Goff, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you very much. Good to be here. The topic we're going to focus on today is Galileo and consciousness. Now, Galileo is often thought of as an astronomer. What's he got to say about consciousness? Well, Galileo is known as the father of modern science, and I think it's because it's Galileo that really shapes the philosophical foundations of the scientific revolution. Galileo's declaration that mathematics was to be the language of the new science, that the new science was to have a purely quantitative vocabulary, in many ways, this is the philosophical move that kickstarts the scientific revolution. What's less focused on is the philosophical work Galileo had to do to get there, and how, as well as being a great scientist, he was also a great philosopher. So I'm not familiar with that. What sort of things did he say that are directly philosophical? So Galileo wanted the new science to have a purely quantitative vocabulary. Before Galileo, following Aristotle people thought the world was filled with qualities. There are colours on the surfaces of objects and smells floating through the air and tastes actually inside food. And the problem is you, you can't capture these kind of qualities in a purely quantitative vocabulary. You can't capture the spiciness of paprika in an equation. This was a problem for Galileo's aspiration to exhaustively describe the physical world in mathematics. So what he had to do was to propose a radically new philosophical theory of reality. And what was that theory? So according to this theory, the qualities aren't really out there in the physical world, rather they're in the consciousness of the observer. The redness of a tomato isn't really on the surface of the tomato, it's rather in the consciousness of the person observing the tomato, or the spiciness of paprika isn't really in paprika, it's in the consciousness of the person eating it. So Galileo, as it were, stripped the physical world of its qualities, and after he'd done that, all that remained were the purely quantitative features of matter, size, shape, location, motion, properties that can be captured in mathematical geometry. So we've got this radically new world view where there's this division between the quantitative world of science, matter with its quantitative mathematical properties, and the qualitative world of consciousness, which for Galileo was outside the domain of science. That sounds very much like what I know as Robert Boyle's corpuscularian hypothesis, you know, the idea that red, for instance, is a quality that is in consciousness, but it's produced by a texture of things in the world, the way the corpuscles are arranged as he would have it. So there is a thing out there with these basic properties of shape and size that produces an effect on a certain kind of consciousness that we call red. And that sounds like a scientific explanation of what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this all goes back to Galileo, I think, and is, is explored in more detail by Descartes, and then Locke comes up with this terminology of primary and secondary qualities. And as you say, Boyle takes it on. It's really the philosophical framework of the scientific revolution and one that lives with us to this day, whether we realize it or not. It's crucial to appreciate that Galileo kicks off mathematical physics, which has, of course, gone very well. But for these early scientists and philosophers, physical science was never intended to be a complete description of reality. In fact, the whole project was premised on setting consciousness outside of the domain of science. This is interesting about Galileo, but why is it important in our understanding of 
problems around consciousness specifically? I mean, I think this has profound implications for the science of consciousness. So it's broadly agreed now that consciousness poses a profound challenge for contemporary science despite rapid progress in our understanding of the brain, we still don't have even the beginnings of an explanation of how complicated electrochemical signaling is somehow able to give rise to the inner subjective world of colours and sounds and smells and tastes that each of us knows in our own case. But although this problem is taken very seriously, one very common reaction is to say... OK, well, you know, there's a problem here, but we just need to plug away with our standard methods of investigating the brain and we'll one day crack it. And I think the reason people think this is because they think, well, look at the great success of physical science in explaining more and more of our universe. This ought to give us confidence that it'll one day solve the mystery of consciousness. I think this view is rooted in a certain kind of misunderstanding of the history of science. Yes, physical science has been so successful, but it's been so successful precisely because it was designed to exclude consciousness. If Galileo were to time travel to the present day and hear about this problem of explaining consciousness in the terms of physical science, he'd say, of course you can't do that. I designed physical science to deal with quantities, not qualities. Are you sure you're not giving up too quickly here and just saying that Galileo set things off on the wrong foot? Because... There are philosophers who think that we are making ground in understanding qualitative experience through a scientific explanation. Obviously, neuroscience is absolutely crucial for a science of consciousness. But I think what we need to appreciate is what neuroscience provides us with are correlations between activity in the brain and conscious experiences. So, you know, you can scan someone's brain and you can ask them what they're feeling and experiencing and you can discover, for example, that a certain kind of activity in the hypothalamus always goes along with the feeling of hunger. And that's a really important body of information, accumulating these correlations and any theory of consciousness must respect that. But that in itself is not a theory of consciousness. What we ultimately want from a science of consciousness is to explain those correlations. You know, why is it when people have that kind of activity in the hypothalamus, they feel hunger? And the problem is, coming back to Galileo, I believe our adoption of the Galilean worldview blocks us from answering that question. There's no getting away from the fact that consciousness is an essentially quality-involving phenomenon. You know, you think about the redness of a red experience, the smell of coffee, the taste of mint. And these kind of qualities, by definition, cannot be incorporated in a purely quantitative account of the physical world or the brain. So long as we're wedded to Galileo's purely quantitative understanding of the physical world, we're never going to be able, I don't think, to bring together the quantitative and the qualitative in a single unified theory of reality. All we're going to be able to do is what we've been doing for the past 80, 100 years, is mapping correlations. Does that mean then that you're a mysterian? Colin McGinn had this notion that we can't ever understand consciousness. It's too difficult for consciousness to understand itself. Is that your position? Not at all. So, you know, pessimists might draw from what I've been saying that we'll never have a science of consciousness. That's not my approach. I think we can be confident that we will have a science of consciousness, but we need to rethink what science is. If we now want a science of consciousness, I think we need to move to a more expansive, post-Galilean understanding of science, a scientific methodology able to accommodate both the quantitative properties of matter that physical science has been dealing so well with for the past four or five hundred years, and the qualitative reality of consciousness that each of us knows from our immediate understanding of our feelings and experiences. And what would that qualitative and quantitative science be like? I think there is a way forward here, and it's rooted in very important work from the 1920s, of the philosopher Bertrand Russell and the scientist Arthur Eddington, who's incidentally the first scientist to confirm general relativity. 
I'm inclined to think these guys did in the 1920s for the science of consciousness what Darwin did in the 19th century for the science of life, and it's a sort of tragedy of history that it got completely forgotten about for so long. The starting point of Russell and Eddington was that physical science doesn't really tell us what matter is. And that seems at first like a kind of bizarre claim. You, you read a physics textbook, it seems you find out all these incredible things about the nature of space and time and matter. But what Russell and Eddington realized is that physical science, for all its richness, is confined to telling us about the behavior of matter, about what it does. Physical science tells us that matter has mass and charge. These properties are characterized entirely in terms of behavior. You know, charge is a matter of attraction and repulsion. Mass is defined in terms of gravitational attraction and resistance to acceleration. This is all about behavior. Physics is completely silent on what philosophers like to call the intrinsic nature of matter, how matter is in and of itself, independently of its behavior. So it turns out there's actually this huge hole in our scientific worldview. And now the proposal of Eddington really building on Russell was to put consciousness in that hole. The result is a form of panpsychism, the ancient view that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of reality. But this is a kind of panpsychism that's stripped of any mystical or spiritual connotations. So the idea is that there's just matter, nothing spiritual or supernatural, but matter can be described from two perspectives. Physical science describes it, as it were, from the outside in terms of its behavior, but matter from the inside, that is to say, in terms of its intrinsic nature, is constituted of forms of consciousness. So I like to put it, in the 1620s, Galileo divorced the qualitative from the quantitative. In the 1920s, Russell and Eddington finally found a way of bringing them back together. That's fascinating. But could there be any evidence that it is an accurate picture of reality? My starting point is, we know that consciousness exists. Nothing is more evident than the reality of our feelings and experiences. It follows from that that we have to take consciousness as a basic datum in its own right, over and above the data of observation experiments. In this post-Galilean understanding of science, we just have to look for the most simple elegant view of the world that is able to account for both the data of observation experiments and the reality of consciousness. I think as a scientific community, we still haven't quite got on board with this. Not many people are prepared to deny the reality of consciousness, but people don't appreciate that it follows that consciousness is a datum in its own right, in addition to the data of observation experiments. If I've got a theory of reality that can account for all the data of observation experiments but can't account for the reality of consciousness, that theory can't be true or is at best incomplete because it misses out something real. And what we're actually finding now is scientists and philosophers coming together to lay the foundations for this new approach to consciousness, working out some of our leading neuroscientific theories in this new philosophical post-Galilean framework. As far as consciousness is concerned, doesn't that still leave a huge problem? If I say this table in front of me has some very, very low level of consciousness, how do I get from the table, the material thing, which is also a conscious thing, to me? Hopefully I'm, I've got a higher level of consciousness than the table. Just putting lots more bits together doesn't seem to explain how I get self-conscious. One common misunderstanding, the panpsychist needn't think that literally everything is conscious. The starting point is the fundamental constituents of physical reality, perhaps electrons and quarks, have unimaginably simple forms of experience. But it doesn't follow that every random collection of particles, like a table, for example, is also conscious. But you write what is generally taken to be the biggest challenge for a panpsychist theory, the so-called combination problem, is how we get from facts about particle consciousness 
to facts about systems level human consciousness, which is of course what we ultimately want to explain. So I would say nobody yet has a complete theory of consciousness. It's very early days in the science of consciousness, but it seems to me the problems facing the panpsychist research program just seem to be more tractable than the problems facing a materialist research program. For the materialist, you've got this huge explanatory gap. How on earth do you get from the purely quantitative objective properties that physical science talks about to the qualitative subjective properties of consciousness and no one's given us the first inkling of how we bridge that gap despite lots of effort the challenge for the panpsychist rather is how do you get from simple forms of subjective experience to more complex forms of subjective experience this is what the main energy of the panpsychist research program is focused on you know, it might not work out in the end but i think it's worth giving a shot now you've clearly been entertaining a panpsychist account for a while has it changed how you think about reality? I mean, how you live and think about your connection with the world? Yeah, that's a very good question. I always want to emphasise that when we're doing science or philosophy, we should be thinking not about the view we'd like to be true, but the view that's most likely to be true. And I think there's a really good case for the probable truth of panpsychism on the basis that it's the best proposal about how consciousness fits into reality. Nonetheless, I do think panpsychism is a view of the world that's maybe slightly better for our mental or spiritual well-being. Materialism is kind of quite bleak. You've got this essentially mechanistic picture of nature and then the cold immensity of empty space. Whereas on a panpsychist view, we are conscious creatures in a conscious universe. It's maybe a picture of the world in which we can feel a little bit more at home, a little bit more comfortable in our own skin. And I also think it has potential perhaps to lead to a better relationship with the environment. We're in this environmental crisis right now. If you think of a tree as essentially a mechanism, then you're re inevitably going to think of its value indirectly in terms of what it can do for us, in terms of looking pretty or sustaining our existence, more importantly. But if you think, as many panpsychists do, that a, a tree is a in some very alien sense, a conscious entity in its own right, then chopping down a tree is, a, is an act of immediate moral significance. So I think this has the potential to lead to a very different and perhaps healthier relationship to the environment. I am inclined to think our current official scientific worldview is in some deep sense inconsistent with the reality of consciousness. Consciousness is at the core of human identity, we fundamentally relate to each other as conscious beings with feelings and experiences and emotions. So I, I do wonder a little bit what effect it has on people's mental health if their official worldview is somehow incompatible with their very core of their existence. I mean, we're living in strange times at the moment. I wonder whether our official worldview and its incompatibility, in my view, with the reality of consciousness might have something to do with that. Philip Goff, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been good to chat. For more Philosophy Bites, go to www.philosophybites.com. You can also find details there of Philosophy Bites books and how to support us.